Hey, welcome to Hard Boiled Synthesis, Lecture 22. Today I'm going to cover publication bias, which is something that you need to have, always have on your radar when you're doing a research synthesis project. For me, I want to spend some time figuring out whether or not my data set has some, has some funny business going on. <laughs> um, there's already a ton of stuff, including whether or not it's incredibly heterogeneous. Um, it's heterogeneous uh, with uh, experimental design across mosquitoes, but I still have to do like a rubber stamp in terms of whether or not there's fundamental uh, biases in my data set. The one uh, which uh, we're going to cover today is publication bias, which basically means that your data are non-random representation, non-random sample of the literature. And we know that there's a lot of mechanisms out there in terms of in, uh, creating a lot of missingness in, in what gets published. And the negative effect, it me means that, um, studies with uh, null outcomes may have unusually low representation in the literature. I don't know if that's the case now with newer publications, but maybe the older ones would experienced this where you would do an experiment and you found a null outcome and then you chose not to publish it. You just chose to file it, put it in the file drawer, as they say, and it means that the study was done, but no one can read it, no one could access it, and a consequence is that it doesn't get included in your data set. And a crucial part of stats is that your samples represent a random sample of the population. Same thing with synthesis level stuff is, you know, you hope that the collection of studies you include in your synthesis represents a random sample of the population of things that are out there. But again, publication bias is one of these mechanisms that could create a non-random sample skewing a representation towards studies with uh, strong, positive, significant effects. So things with, again, null effects, or maybe things that are even negative effects get underrepresented represented in the literature because maybe the researcher thought it wasn't interesting. Maybe the editors at journals thought it wasn't interesting. There are many reasons for that stuff. In the end, publication bias is basically a catch-all for a whole load of stuff that a uh, whole load of mechanisms that create non-random um, appearances of studies in the literature. And so in terms of uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do some quick simulations. I hope they're quick. I hope there's no problems. And to then just simply follow through with a publication bias test, Edgar's test. My opinions on Edgar's test are on the range on a spectrum of like being negative to positive they're leaning way towards the negative side mostly because it's like this thing a thing that you include checklist wise for your meta-analysis there's not much thought put into why you're doing that test in the first place or whether it's even appropriate in ecology man the default is heterogeneity and in fact that's what we're excited about because we want to find predictors explanations for that variability. Um, but Edgar's test is just, if your data is variable, it invalidates the Edgar's test to begin with. It assumes a fixed effect meta-analysis. If you, oh yeah, analysis time. This will officially will be the last quick analysis before I start pulling together the manuscript. So I'm gonna go into R, go into, um, the simulations that we did way back, way back when we were covering fixed effect meta analyses, where I sampled, show you the effects of sampling here. Now I'm going to show you the effects of um, non-random sampling with meta analysis. I forget where I was going with this, other than uh, the Eggers test assumes a fixed effect meta analysis, right? So it assumes this. Hope this works. Um, these are effect sizes that are sampled from a single population of effects. Right. A consequence of that is you get this nice funnel distribution where you have a sampling error here on the X axis. You have your effect sizes on the Y studies with few samples can oh, hugely over or underestimate the effect that sampling error and studies with many, many samples, large sample sizes converge near the um, 
population effect. We're going to modify this model now um, to try to introduce the consequences of um, publication bias. Edgar's test assumes that um, there's an asymmetry that's going to occur in this plot. That if, if there is publication bias, for simplicity's sake, assuming that it's related to p-values, null outcomes, um, you're going to get a gap occurring in this plot where studies with null outcomes don't get published. A consequence of that is you don't have null effects, which creates a big hole in this distribution. Consequence of that is downstream, when you do your meta-analysis, you're going to have biased synthesis level outcome because your effect sizes do not represent a random sample. They are biased now. They are biased towards studies with significant positive effects. So now it's just let's tweak this model here to make it um, quickly assess publication bias. I say quickly, but man, it's going to be um, awful because I haven't touched this in a while. Um, first goal is to make a more classic funnel shape, which is if you read the literature, it has the axes kind of swapped. I hope all this works. The problem with these Monte Carlo stuff is, you know, they are sensitive to uh, themselves, sensitive to sampling here. All right, I already messed up. Close these windows. Okay, so this is the this is the classic funnel shape that, and when, if you ever come across research synthesis and you hear publication bias, funnel distribution, funnel plots, this is it. Okay, so the effect sizes are on the x-axis, and some measure of sampling error is on the y-axis. Here I use the sample sizes, but the the classic funnel distributions assume either the inverse variances, the weights for meta-analysis, or the variances, or the standard errors. There's like a ton of ways to model this stuff. So the goal next is to replace this null line. Oh, no, no. The goal next is to uh, simulate data with a with an effect. Right now we simulated just a bunch of studies with null, null effects. And so I'm just going to assume that the effect is fairly strong, 0.05. What's going to happen here, this is going to skew the funnel towards 0.05 but we still have long tails because of sampling error right sampling error is one of these things even though the true population effect is a correlation of 0.5 if you have very very few uh replicates very few sample sizes it doesn't matter you could span from minus 5 minus 0.05 to almost minus 1 that's what we're seeing here is um that effect. If, if you're hearing funny noises, it's because my son is doing homework. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so the next step is to replace this line here with the meta-analysis line of the pooled effect rather than the rigid uh, predicted effect. Right, so the goal now is for meta-analysis to predict the 0.05 line with these data. And the way to do that is I'm going to modify this um, ab line in the graph to just include the regression coefficients of a meta-analysis. I'm using metaphor again to pull the study outcomes. I'm going to pull the effect sizes, which are again our Pearson correlations. I already messed that up. Then I want the weights. which I forget what it is, but it's calculated and Metagear calculates the weights for you. And then I want a classic meta-analysis, so I'm going to throw in a between study variance component. Now, there's no reason to expect at the moment that this line is actually going to be close to 0.05. As Monte Carlo simulations, you know, I simulated effect sizes with a really... Um, negative binomial distribution where there's a, like many studies with few samples but then few with many samples which means that sampling error at the synthesis level is fairly high and so I'm going to run the simulation a few times hopefully getting one where the pooled effect through meta-analysis is close to 0.05 
I forgot to add the regression coefficients to the model. One more time. Okay, so this line now, rather than it being at the 0.05, exactly 0.05 as the simulation, um, now it's an estimate of that value, which is close to 0.05. I mean, it's not perfect. Let's do it again. There we go. So now we have a slightly less than 0.05. Um, again, this is sampling error occurring at the simulation level, right? Even though I'm replicating 500 effect sizes, 500 effect sizes is not enough to effectively estimate the predicted effect um, because of the way I simulated the effect sizes. I simulated effect size with huge sampling error variability. But I'm happy with this. This is close close to 0.05. And so now I'm just going to avoid simulating those data again. And now I'm just going to change, change the relationship of these data based on um, publication bias. So now we have a nice data set where if you did a conventional meta-analysis, you would find an estimated pooled effect that was close to 0.05, close to the true underlying population effect. Now I want to um, create bias in this data set, publication bias. And so now I'm going to try to figure out how to exclude all the effect sizes that are non-significant. And so because I estimated the correlation coefficients, there's some neat equations that I could use to uh, quickly calculate a p-value from those correlation coefficients. And I'm going to first simulate them as a, using a t-test. And I got the equations written down already. I don't know this stuff by heart. Um, we're going to take the effect and then we divide it by the square root of the complement of the effect squared minus the Sample size divided by two. Let's see if this works. I hope I wrote it right. I'm just checking to see if this thing's results are super weird. No, everything looks good. Let's double check the equation. R divided by the square root of a complement of the... This is all mumbo jumbo. I used to remember what this stuff meant, but I don't anymore. Okay, we got our t-test. Now we want p-values from the t-test. Again, we're going to exclude all the correlations that are non-significant, right? Simulating publication bias occurring in a literature. Null outcomes aren't getting published. They're not getting included in the meta-analysis. Now, estimating the uh, probability distribution from a t-test is a bit ugly. We're going to assume it's two-tailed. PT is a function in the stats package, automatically loaded at default in base R. We take the absolute value of the uh, T here. And then throw in the sample size with minus two degrees of freedom. Check if the parentheses are working here. All right, let's see. Okay, so I don't know if I've done this right. Hopefully I've done it, done it right. Um, the idea now is each effect has an associated p-value associated with it. Um, and now I'm just going to drop all the studies With them, uh, first, I'm going to do a meta analysis with just a p. How am I going to do this? Um, first, let's exclude all the studies. No, no, let's let's do a visualization first. Since it's a probability, I could just quickly throw it in the way I color stuff. 
let's see what this looks like. Okay, this is gonna change the color. The coloration I have it so far was before I had it colored by the weighting. So it's things that would get underweighted in a meta analysis where it was in red, and things where that would get heavily weighted was in blue. Now I changed it so that the color coatings reflect uh, their significance value based on P. Okay, so here, everything that's blue, uh, I hope you could see this. Yes. Everything that's blue now are studies, oof, I really don't know what that means. I mean, <laughs> it, it's going through a, uh, okay. I got, no, no, I could interpret this. So it, studies that have a uh, really small p-values are in red and things with really large p-values are in blue. So a lot of these studies are showing um, um, fairly good significance tests. I don't know. What, I don't know what I mean by that. Um, but it just means like uh, a lot of the studies that are in the sampling error range are getting really um, bad p-values. That was not good at all. I think it's probably just easier if I just drop, let me just drop all the, all the significant correlations, all the significant effect sizes, and see what the distribution looks like, whether or not it's still funnel shaped or has some other distribution. I think that's pretty easy. Keep all the P values that are smaller than 0 0.05. Let's see what this looks like. All right, there you go. So now it's less funnily shaped. Um, there's a huge uh, drop. So everything that was a non-significant has got dropped, right? And so now we have a distribution that is no longer funnel shaped, but there's a gap. There's a gap in, in um, the representation of studies where if you would assume a sampling error, uh, if you would assume the effect sizes were a random sample of the population, now we have a non-random sample of the population because many of the effect sizes with um, with uh, p-values of a certain measure get excluded. Let's do the opposite of this, and let's include only those studies where there is no p-values. Okay, so these are all the, there aren't really that many null p-values, to be honest. That's that's kind of the way I simulated the data. But you can see that the funnel distribution here is all over the place. And it's like, seems like it's centered across something totally other than the predicted effect. Um, uh, but these are important. These are necessary. Like a in order for our distribution, in order for our stats to work, we need to include all the effects that are null, irrespective of the p-value. You know, a core philosophy of meta-analysis is who gives two bananas about p-values, right? What we're pulling out of studies are effect sizes, sampling error, and sample sizes. We are the ones that are making decisions on the, um, on the outcomes of the studies. Unfortunately, we don't get to make that decision because we are like a second, like a totally different, um, we occupy different spaces in the hierarchy of research, right? We're doing synthesis level stuff. And so we don't really get to decide whether or not representation with null outcomes are exist in a literature, but we could we can make some tests. We could evaluate things. Okay. So the last thing I want to do to make the point is, um, we are going to include all the significant effects include all the significant effects 
and now add the line where we repeat the meta-analysis. What am I doing here? Now we repeat the meta-analysis by excluding um, Right, okay, what am I doing? This is not working out for me. Okay, so goal now is to include only the study with significant effects. I'm just checking to see if this is exactly what I'm doing. And then I'll move on to the final uh, Eggers test. Yes, okay, okay. So I am kind of doing this right. I just feel like I didn't, I'm not using the, the best possible simulated data to try to do this stuff, to make it, to uh, best visualize the outcomes. Okay, so keep only the effect sizes that are significant and then do the meta-analysis with only the effect sizes that are significant. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we got a shift, shift in the pooled average, which is um, bigger than it should be, right? And that's the challenge with uh, data set that are um, biased, data sets that have um, some de degree of erosion due to the publication bias is that they tend to overestimate the effect. I mean, all you're doing is including significant effects in your data set. You're going to get a synthesis level outcome that is also strong, significant effect. <laughs> um, I mean, there you go. I don't know if this is probably the best way to show you guys the impacts of um, publication bias. I, I think the take home message is like when you're doing a non-random sample of the literature with the really uh, unusual lens that null results are underrepresented, you're probably going to get a synthesis level effect that overestimates the true underlying effect, because all you're doing is including significant outcomes. Those null outcomes are crucial. They're essential to properly modeling the distributional properties of analyses and predicted effects. All right, well, this may not have been the clearest example, but there you have it. Um, there's a ton of literature out there anyway that could better explain this <laughs> than I do. Uh, but I'm going to move on now. All right. So now the goal is to change the data set and then test for whether or not publication bias occurs in the um, catnip data. And so things are going to look slightly different here because I'm going to use canned functions from uh, meta metaphor again. Um, basically, I'm going to use metaphor to plot the funnel distribution, and I'm going to use metaphor to estimate Edgar's test. Edgar's test, again, is a test for publication bias between you and me, secretly, right? It's a it's a asymmetry test. It's not technically testing for publication bias. It's assuming a publication bias is one of these things that creates a non-random sample. Many mechanisms can do that. It is unable to actually figure that out. All it could do is tell you is whether or not there's a asymmetry in the funnel. We know there's a lot of things that could happen in terms of um, impacting the funnel symmetry, including if your effect sizes are heterogeneous. Um, or you have few effect sizes to begin with, right? The issue I had with the simulation is I wasn't simulating enough effects to uh, properly visualize the um, errors associated with publication bias. Um, that's the same with your meta-analysis is, you know, if you have few effect sizes, 
all these tests just break down. Now I have a lot of fair, I, okay, I don't, can't say I have a lot of effect sizes for my catnip data set. That's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of silly uh, thing to say, but there's enough to kind of figure out a little bit. Um, another issue with Edgar's test, I'm kind of rambling here. Another issue with Edgar's test is um, if you have outliers, this is, I guess it's not different from any other stats diagnostic test is if you have outliers, it just messes up the whole thing. And so the goal with plotting the funnel distribution is one, you could assess outliers to visually assess heterogeneity. That's more ideally um, quantified using meta-analysis. Um, but just to keep things simple, let's just run a flat out Eggers test on our effect sizes and see what washes out. And so I kind of have things already coded here. We're gonna assume a fixed effect meta-analysis, fixed effect, um, something that does not include the between study variance, right? Not a proper meta-analysis, but that's what Egger tests assumes is the fixed effect model. <laughs> um, and, then, and, then, and then we'll let it do its thing to see if there's a, um, if our data are asymmetric in the funnel, funnel sense. All right, let me check to see if you see this. You do. All right, so right off the bat, we know right away <laughs> clearly that we have two things going on here. We have an outlier in terms of effect sizes. All right, this is way out. This isn't hedges D, right? Hedges D are like units of standard deviations. This is like 300 standard deviations from the mean. This is like epic level random chance here, right? A meteor crashing into the earth. Maybe that's even like the creation of the universe level probability. Um, and so, yeah, there's something funny here, but luckily it's not getting weighted heavily in the meta-analysis at all. In fact, it's probably not getting weighted much relative to everything else. Now, the bummer part, what I see here is there are a bunch of effects that are getting weighted super heavily relative to everything else. That's another thing I need to look into. I'm not going to talk about that today, but once I start pulling the manuscript together, I really need to start thinking more about what I'm going to do with these underlying effects. So right here, just visually violate Edgar's tests. We got outliers. We got, we got outliers. We got huge variability in the weights. I think that's another assumption of Edgar's test is that the, relative difference amongst weights cannot be tremendously variable here we got weights on totally different magnitudes in that in that um and now it's saying that we're not seeing a significant eggers test and the eggers test that i assume here is based on the variance plotting the variance here i got the actual weights the inverse variance the reciprocal weights on the y-axis um, this is why the distribution looks super funny. The outliers will make the distribution look super funny. But I imagine if I would do this with standard errors, which is the more conventional approach to testing Edgar's test, it's probably as significant. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into this plot. I'm going to ignore these super heavily weighted studies. I'm going to ignore this outlier. I want to see what's going on in this pocket here, whether it does have that something we could describe as a distribution. And I think that all that involves is me, I guess, adding limits to the plot. We're going to add a Y limit. Y limit, what should the Y limit be? Um, super small effect to 10 hedges D, I guess. And then the X limit, which was, um, I mean, we got that huge outlier of uh, hedges D of being 300 minus 300. Let's just drop that. Uh, all right, here it goes. Let me close this plot. Okay, there we go. So that's a more conventional looking, um, more conventional looking a funnel plot. Um, it, it, it is kind of behaving what you would expect, right? Um, 
studies with like a lot of variation in their effect are due to sampling error. They have few replications, right? Um, and then studies with higher, more sample sizes in here um, are converging towards the uh, null effect or the no effect. And so, okay, I'm happy with this outside of like, I just excluded outliers from this plot. Um, and so if when I come pull, pull together the manuscript, I'll have like the overall plot and then this magnified version next to it. Um, now you're probably seeing like these weird uh, chained, chained effects and the weights. That is evidence for a single study. Uh, uh, not a single study, sorry. Effects is, <laughs> effects is? Um, effect sizes that have the same underlying sample size. And remember with the, um, with the uh, catnip studies, everything is super under replicated. They were like the maximum sample size was 10. And so I imagine all these chained effect sizes are probably those studies that report sample size of three or five not huge variability. So what you're seeing is the variability associated with the effect, um, not the variability associated with the sample size because the sample size is the same. But what happens is, you know, you get this distribution associated with that because everything has the same sample size, but what varies is the effect. Woo! Anyway, I've always wanted to write a paper about this type of stuff. It's fairly common in ecology. Um, but anyway, there you have it. So... Uh, takeaway from all this stuff is publication bias is something you need to have on your radar whenever you do a research synthesis project. Whether or not you have the data to actually properly test it, mm, that really depends. In ecology, often not because you have significant heterogeneity to begin with, which violates one of the rules, violates one of the assumptions of, of Edgar's test. Now, right now, it's a super awesome time to actually address these issues because there's new models uh, available to actually include some of that in your meta-analysis. Before this was just a diagnostic, but now we can model this stuff. Um, this is beyond the scope of what I want you guys to see, um, but I just want to put that maybe on your uh, to-do list is to look at more of these elaborate modeling tools. All right, well, I feel like I'm at the end now. So we are done the analysis part of the course. Some analyses I'm going to redo over again once I start pulling together the manuscript. And so this is the official um, light end of the course in terms of me working on the project. The next stage for me is to start pulling together the manuscript. And I will do that for you guys too. I mean, writing up is some of the most difficult things, at least for me. Writing stuff is hard. And so you'll get to see some of the stuff I use to kind of make sense of these uh, these wild results in meta-analysis. And so again, I'm pushing through with my original promises with the course, even though uh, the pace has uh, is uh, not as quick as I used to originally imagined, um, but I'm still going to do this weekly. Right on, folks. Let's push forward and Hopefully in the next month, I'll have an actual manuscript um, and then this course will be done. But uh, until then, onwards and upwards. Take care, friends.